Perfect. All right. It is seven o'clock and we'll get started. Hello, uh, my name is Tony. Uh, I work for Jackson County Conservation and thank you all so much for joining me on this virtual program. Tonight we'll be talking about all about spring ephemerals and some wildflowers. Um, if you are new to Zoom, this is a Zoom webinar, so I'm not able to see your face or hear your voice, but if you have anything um, you want to ask or talk about, if you kind of move your mouse around down the bottom of your screen, there is a little chat function that you can um, go in there, ask questions, or just say hi to the other um, participants. Okay, I am going to share my screen and we will get started. All right, and cool. All right, um, tonight our talk is all about spring ephemerals, wildflowers of Eastern Iowa. So before we get started, I'll give you a little um, background on myself. I work for um, Jackson County Conservation. Our office is right outside of Maquoketa. So if you head um, to Maquoketa on Highway 61 or that big brown building that's just north of Maquoketa, um, we're kind of setting that prairie next to that wetland there. Uh, Jackson County Conservation, we manage a number of properties. We have close to 3,000 acres of public land, parks, campgrounds, preserves, great places to hike and recreate and um, wildlife view and in this time of year do some wildflower hunting but our main office there is at the Hurstville Interpretive Center. If you aren't familiar with the great state of Iowa um the here is the here's Iowa the red county is Jackson County and that's kind of where I'm situated at. For future events or news revolving around Jackson County conservation you can visit our website at jacksonccb.com uh, you can go to the Hurstville Interpretive Center Facebook page or you can um, stop by the Hurstville Center, get our newsletter, or sign up for our newsletter via email. So what I do is I am a naturalist, so I mostly do environmental education with Jackson County Conservation, but I also get to help out with some land management and habitat projects. Um, to get so to get started, um, we're going to be talking about spring ephemerals tonight, and a spring ephemeral is those early spring wildflowers that first emerge, um, you know, this time of year, starting late February, depending on, on where you're at or what the conditions are like, early March, kind of through April, end of May, sort of in there. Those early blooming flowers that first emerge and they take advantage of the sunlight that is coming in and hitting the forest floor before the trees leaf out and kind of shade out to the ground, okay? They call them ephemerals. Ephemeral meaning is kind of short-lived. So these blooms kind of come and go um, pretty quickly. So we're going to be talking about um, some more common species or species that you're likely to find if you go hiking in the woods around here in eastern Iowa or Jackson County in the next month or so. I would consider myself a uh, pretty avid flower hunter. I, you know, we have there's birders who go out and look for birds. I'm a flower hunter. I have my flower list and I go out and try to check off as many uh, wildflowers throughout the growing season as, as possible and always trying to add uh, new ones I've never seen before. So I'm gonna go through a handful of species that we can find here in Eastern Iowa. Some are common, some aren't so common, but ones that we all can see. So the very first one is one of my favorites and that is skunk cabbage. Skunk cabbage is usually the first wildflower you see blooming um, hereabouts. It is a, it's a, it's a wet loving plant. You're going to kind of find it in wetlands and bogs and seeps. Kind of think of like the bluffy areas in northeast Iowa. Think of like at the base of a bluff where you might have a little spring or some water coming out making that ground soggy right there. That's a seep. Skunk cabbage loves seeps. And it's one of the very first ones to bloom. And skunk cabbage does this really cool thing. It's a thermogen thermogenic plant, which means it kind of can create its own heat. And the temperature inside the plant can be upwards about 30-ish degrees, sometimes higher than um, the air temperature around it. And it causes 
the ground around the plant to thaw out faster than the ground surrounding it. So this plant can start emerging when most of the ground is frozen, there's some snow on the ground. Here is some pictures. Let me turn on my, let me turn on my laser pointer. Here are some pictures of skunk cabbage I took this spring. You can kind of see it in this wet, seepy area. The picture in the bottom right, that's what skunk cabbage looks like completely leaf out after the bloom is done. So skunk cabbage is interesting. It has um, this safe, which is, uh, which is like a kind of a special protection around the flower. And then this yellow crazy looking thing in the middle, that's called the spadix. And that is um, where the, the flower actually is. And this plant doesn't smell that good. It has a, it has, they call it like a, a fetid odor. It kind of smells gross or kind of like meat. And it, it attracts um, flies and some early beetles and stuff, kind of attracting, um, insects that would be attracted to, to dead stuff, right? So they're coming in, um, they're thinking maybe it's some dead meat, they're getting in there, getting the pollen all over it, and they move on to the next plant to pollinate. Pretty interesting. Down here on the bottom is the range map. So I'm gonna have, include a range map with all the plants we talk about tonight. And a range map just kind of shows where the plant is known to be found. And they give you a really good idea of where these plants are found. Um, sometimes, when you're looking at range maps, you have to kind of take them with a little bit of grain of salt. So here is my range map. We have the continental United States and the green is the states that it's found in and the light green is the counties that it's present in. But sometimes you look at in the middle of a range map and there's like a county that it is missing in, but it's surrounded by counties that it's known in. You can sometimes make the, the assumption it's probably there. So that's the kind of the grain of salt that I'm talking about. Um, I see I have a question here. It says, where can you see skunk cabbage? We looked for it off the Heritage Trail near Epworth, no luck. Um, I know that people have seen it on off the Heritage Trail near Dubuque. I've never looked for it there. The place that I find it every year is at Swiss Valley um, Wildlife Refuge, or Swiss Valley Wildlife Area, not the campground, but like where the Swiss Valley Nature Center is. If you go on the Woodland Ecology Trail and follow it to the Hanging Bog, that is um, the place that it is there. It's kind of like a seep off the bluff. creates this really interesting little habit, microhabitat called the Hanging Bog, and that's where I see it every year. So that is where um, that is where I always find my skunk cabbage. This is where I took this picture there um, two nights ago. I took the picture on the right by about three weeks ago. So it's flowering there right now. And then this bottom right hand corner is what it'll look like here come um, later in spring, summertime. Cool. All right, let's keep moving right along. Oh, I'm also going to mention that, oh, I already mentioned this, it's pollinated by flies and some beetles and, and some bees, but the stuff that is kind of attracted to that meat smell. Um, I got down and I, I gave it a sniff the other night because I never actually tried to smell it, but it does, it smells like raw meat to me, which is really interesting. All right. I think my computer may have frozen up. Mm -hmm. There we go. Had to click. All right, the next one is another early spring bloomer. This is the first, this is the second um, bloom that I've seen this spring. I first saw it um, two weeks ago at one of our wildlife areas. This is called Spring Beauty. It's a small little delicate flower. You're going to see it kind of blooming starting in early, mid-March. It likes moist, open woodlands. Um, its leaves look like blades of grass but they're opposite on the plant. And they kind of have this delicate white pink flower. The ones that I see, kind of like the one that's pictured here on the right, is whitish, but it has like these pinkish purple little rays, little um, bands going on the petals there. Um, and this one is pollinated by some of those really early emerging woodland bees, like minor bees, and some like different types of woodland flies, things like that. Some of the first insects that emerge and utilize it as a nectar source right away after um, the growing season kind of starts. So looking down here 
on a range map. This is a pretty common one that you can find um, throughout the entire um, eastern half of the United States, except for that south southeast corner. It doesn't look like Florida is a good place for it, but you find it in Iowa, especially the eastern half of Iowa. When you start getting into northwest Iowa, there's a lot less woodlands and you don't see it as often. Um, most of the species I'm talking about tonight are fairly woodland species. I will throw in a few prairie species in there because Iowa is a prairie state and one of my favorite habitats. So we'll throw in a few of those as well. So we have another question. So um, Sarah says, you see, you've seen hepatica before spring beauty. And you know, it happens. It kind of depends on what the conditions are like and what's in the seed bank there. And for me, this year, I've seen spring beauty bloom before hepatica. But in years past, I have seen hepatica before I've seen, seen spring beauty. So it's pretty interesting. And kind of a fun note is I keep a phenology calendar of a lot of the blooms I see, and I just base it off of when I observe it. But I've been observing some of these flowers about two weeks before I did last year, which is kind of interesting. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move right along. The next one is the third, um, the third one that I found this year. On the same day I found Spring Beauty, and this is one of my favorite uh, early bloomers. It's called Snow Trillium. There's a handful of trillium um, species that grow in the state. Um, this one's a little bit, you don't find it everywhere. It starts blooming in mid-March. It likes upland limestone rich soil. Um, so that makes sense for a lot of our wildlife areas that we have here in Jackson County. Jackson County is a pretty limestone rich area. There's a lot of upland kind of bluffy areas. That's where I see a lot of this at. You also find snow trillium kind of down in the floodplain, but where there is like a loose gravel or sandbar in that floodplain. It likes that lime rich soil. Um, really small plant. It's kind of thick. The stem's thick. The leaves are kind of thick. Um, and it's low grow to the ground. This one's pollinated by beetles, which is pretty interesting. And trillium species, they're gonna have like three leaves, three sepals, three petals. Trillium, tri, book three. We're looking down at the range map here. So this one isn't as widely dist um, distributed as like spring beauty is. It's kind of found upper Midwest. Um, you're not gonna see it too um, much further west or south than Iowa, which I think is pretty interesting. So blooming right now, um, some good places that I know to look for them is Buzzard Ridge Wildlife Area. If you hike to the overlook there, there's um, you can usually find some some snow trillium out there. They call it snow trillium because a lot of times it's blooming while there's a little bit of snow still on the ground. So oh, we got a question. What so Lisa is asking, what does the yellow color on the map mean? Um, on these maps, the yellow color means that it was observed there at one time, but the um, it is in question if it's still there. Um, maybe not like a, a recently confirmed sighting. That's the way I take it. I could be wrong, but that's what I'm pretty sure it means. Um, Sarah asks. Is this the first time you saw snow trillium this year um, off of Heritage Trail north of Epworth? We, where we didn't see some cabbage. Oh, that's where you first saw it. Thanks, Sarah. Yes, very cool. All right. So moving on to another really early bloom, we have um, hepatica. There's sharp lobed hepatica, and there's round lobed hepatica that you can find around here. I usually see more round lobed hepatica. It's some of those, um, they, really, they like to grow the flower in clusters and their flowers can kind of be variant between like purple, darkish purple, almost white. And if you go out kind of to most woodlands this time of year in Eastern Iowa, you're gonna see these patches of hepatica blooming. And they're really, really cool. Um, they're really starting to bloom hard right now, especially on some of those uh, south facing hills. Uh, it likes upland forest. You might not find it down by the water. You'll find it up in the timber. It's a pretty hairy plant. There's little hairs that kind of grow on the stems and the, on, the, on the leaves as well. Usually there's six to 10 petals 
And this was a, it's a bee pollinated one. Some of those early emerging bees like sweat bees and carpenter bees are gonna um, pollinate this and use it as a nectar source. We're looking down here at our range map, um, kind of like that Western two thirds of Iowa, but the majority of the Eastern United States, maybe not the coastal Eastern United States, but that uh, Midwest, Appalachia um, going through there. You're not gonna find it west of Iowa, not, that, um, not too often at least. All right, this is our first kind of prairie um, early bloomer that um, I'm gonna talk about. This is called Pasque flower. And I've always kind of associate this one in my head with Easter because I usually find it right around Easter time. Just um, in different parts of the state, this has been blooming for a few weeks. It just started um, blooming in the Dubuque area. I found I found it blooming for the first time last weekend. And the weekend before, I checked the same spot and it wasn't blooming yet. This is a low grower. It has these really beautiful purple flowers. Um, this is a dry prairie um, species, so it's probably the first prairie plant to bloom that you that people see blooming. Um, you see it a lot in the less hills too. So if you look at its range map, you're going to see it kind of like the northern prairie states and up up the northern prairie states um, into the mountains um, in kind of high plains. This is the state flower of South Dakota, if that tells you anything about its habitat. It's a really hairy flower. Um, its leaves are really, really deeply lobed and it has these little leaflet segments that are, uh, um, or little teeth that are really slender. Kind of helps with um, water, evaporation of water loss in that dry prairie kind of climate. A uh, really cool place. Um, just north of Dubuque, where I know it blooms, it's called Pullman Prairie Reserve, which is a, a Dubuque County Conservation property. It's a little little property. Um, it's a little prairie remnant on top of a bluff. You hike up top of the hill. Um, if you go there to look for it, now's the time to look. But obviously, um, be really careful and sensitive in those areas because it's a really small, sensitive habitat. Go there with the, the greatest respect that you can. This guy's... Um, this flower is pollinated by some of those early emerging bees and flies as well. Another early um, species you find kind of in the timber, but also in the prairies is early buttercup. Um, I haven't seen it blooming yet, but last year, let me look at my calendar really quick. Last year, tomorrow, so a year ago tomorrow is when I first saw it blooming on some of our prairies. So it might be blooming out there, I just haven't quite seen it yet. It really likes that rocky, sandy, dry prairie and, and like open savanna kind of habitat. Um, it's got the, it's got stalkless leaves. They're kind of hairy. And they're divided into like three segments, kind of slender little leaf segments. And small flower, but it's a uh, pretty bright yellow. And it's um, once once it's out there, it's, it's easy to spot. Um, this one is pollinated by cuckoo bees, mason bees, carpenter bees. Some of those early emerging bee species. If you look at the range map, you can see it kind of found through the tall grass prairie region and even into some of the eastern um, eastern um, woodland regions up into Appalachia and stuff, stuff like that. But this is, you see it a lot in the tall grass prairie um, ecosystems. Bloodroot. This is one that I did see Wednesday was the first bloodroot bloom that I saw this year. Um, Blooms kind of march through May. It likes moist, rich, all the way through well-drained woodland. So like rich woodlands can be a little bit wet, can be a little bit dry, but it likes that rich woodlands. It's got this big showy white flower. It's got have like eight or more petals on it. It has this really interesting circular leaf that you can kind of see behind the flower here, it has these, uh, these lobes and has like some deep sinuses on it as well. They call it blood root. If you um, were to pick it, or if you were to like damage its its root or tuber, it has this really um, it's this red sap that looks very similar to blood. So blood root. Um, this one is pollinated by flies and bees. And kind of an interesting little adaptation that this this flower has. Once the seeds are um, you know seeds are fertilized and the seed pod bursts. Uh, the seeds have a little, uh, little, little thread looking knob on it. So you have the seed and this little white little thread looking thing that's just like pure starch, starch protein. 
and it uh ants come in they grab the seed for that reason because that little food source on it they bring it down into their tunnels that eat that little protein thread and then the seed just there to be planted so pretty cool um this one is widely distributed across the eastern half of the united states once you start getting into the, the to the the plain states you don't see it anymore but where there's woodlands uh you can usually find it if it's pretty rich woodland soil another one that i first found earlier this week blooming even though this one last year was the first flower that i saw blooming so it kind of varies sometimes but this is called false rue anemone um kind of a April, May bloom. I should change that because I saw it blooming in March this year, end of March. It likes moist woodlands. You see a lot kind of in bottom, bottom lands in the woods. You can kind of see it. Yep, I would say bottom lands. It's, uh, it's leaves have these um, rounded segments, like this another kind of three segments and they're really rounded and it has a whitish pink flower. I see, when I see them, usually white, um, but you can, uh, you can see them kind of pinkish too. Another one that's most of these are pollinated by some of those early emerging flies and bees. And there you can see these a lot kind of in that the woodlands and of the Midwest woodlands kind of stuff. It's a pretty small, delicate flower. Toothwort is another one that I just saw my first bloom this week. This is the week that I'm really excited about because all the spring ephemerals are really starting to come out on some of these sunny days. Um, toothwort, a March March bloom, kind of through May. It likes rich, sage, shady woodlands. Got these really deep cut leaves. Another three segment leaf. But if you can kind of see where my, uh, you can kind of see where my laser pointer is. We have our leaf, the three lobed leaflet, three lobes, kind of these teeth coming off of it. The flowers kind of bloom in a loose cluster. Sometimes they kind of look like they're like hanging down a little bit but the flowers themselves aren't that big but the leaves are really distinct and i usually can spot the the herbaceous form that's not blooming before i see it blooming so another another pretty common plant that you see blooming in the eastern half of the united states all right this one is rue an enemy not fall through but rue easily can confuse these ones. This one's a little bit bigger, usually in my mind. This one also, I usually see it blooming a little bit later than false rue. It likes dry, open woodlands. It's got a very similar leaf. Um, has The leaf has three round lobes. And the flower usually only has two through three flowers blooming on it at a time, or false rue, a little bit smaller. Could have more flowers kind of blooming in a cluster sometimes. This one, it does, the petals really do vary in color. Picture is really white, but I've seen it um, pretty darn pink, pretty darn purple. So kind of that pink, white, purple color variant you can see it in. Another one pollinated by woodland bees, and you see it blooming Midwest and Eastern United States, which is kind of the case for a lot of these early spring common ephemerals. Virginia bluebells, and this one is one of my top favorite uh, um, spring wildflowers. They say it blooms from March to May. I think it kind of depends on where you're at. I usually, let me look at my map here really quick. I don't think I saw it. I saw it blooming for the first time last year, April 11th. So I think with maybe some of the, it's supposed to get pretty warm here in the next couple of days, we might see it here in a week or so. You can see the the leaves, the vegetative form of it. It emerges that part emerges pretty early, and then you can see the purple little buds in a cluster before they're bloomed for a long time before it actually blooms. Um, I've seen I've seen like the leaves and the buds of Virginia bluebells. They've been out for a couple of weeks, at least in the spots where I know them at already. But um, it takes a while for them for them to bloom. The leaves when they're really, really small, kind of this pale blue kind of transition to green color. As they kind of get bigger, it turns into a more steady green. It has this beautiful cluster of purple, blue, trumpet-shaped flowers. And a lot of times that flower cluster will kind of hang low under its own weight, kind of nod. This one's pollinated by um, different butterfly species. So we're kind of moving away from 
those early bees. I'm sure there's bees and stuff that might utilize it, but this one, um, butterflies like to utilize some of those early butterflies that come out. Um, there's some really cool places. I don't see it this one too often. It likes that rich, moist woodlands. Um, there is a spot at Prairie Creek Wildlife Recreation Area right here outside of Maquoketa that has a lot of bluebells and it's really cool. I'm, I kind of don't want to tell people about it because I don't want people tromping on them, but there's a spot there, there's a sliver where it's just full of them. So um, contact me if you want to see them and I can, I can maybe cue you in on this, this secret special spot. This one is another one. This one's called, this is a fun one. It's a really common one. Um, it's pretty well known, but it's called Dutchman's Breaches. So if you look at it, we have this flower. It's kind of a fern-like leaf with this long stalk coming off. And those are the flowers hanging there. It's in the same um, kind of family group as like um, Bleeding Heart that you see in a lot of garden varieties. But they have like these spurs coming out of the flower. Um, they kind of look like old timey pantaloons hanging on a drying line kind of billowing in the wind. So that's why they call them Dutchman's breeches. I think of like uh, the, like colonials back in the 1700s with their undergarments blowing in the breeze. This one blooms April through May, but I did see Dutchman's breeches blooming this year in March on um, a few really south facing hills and bluffs. And a few, I even saw them blooming. I think last, early last week, I saw them blooming, which beats the first time I saw this blooming last year by, by about two weeks. It's pretty interesting. This flower emerges, it kind of coincides with the emergence of queen bumblebees. Um, queen bumblebees will come in, use it as a nectar source. Um, a lot of oh, the nectar is usually kind of too far back for a lot of. Um, other insects are reaching there. Get it. The, the, the queen bumblebees will get in there, kind of pry open the petals to get in there to get that nectar, and then in return pollinate them. Um, and has, like, like I said, has a fern like, pretty distinct fern like leaf. And then the flowers come off and hang on a big stalk. You can find them um, kind of that northeast quarter of the United States are pretty common. And it looks like up in the Pacific Northwest, they're there too. I wonder if that's the same species or a subspecies or or what the deal is with that. I'd be interested to see. Looks like we have a question. Ooh, Judy says that backbone has bluebells. That'd be a good place to see them there. I think I've seen them there before too. Good recommendation. All right. The next one is one that's really easily confuse the Dutchman's breeches. And it's one is a little less common depending on where you're at. This one's called squirrel corn. It's in the um, same family as Dutchman's breeches. So here's our, our family right here. This one blooms about the same time. Usually I see it slightly later than Dutchman's breeches. It likes moist open woodlands and a very similar leaf. The leaves are a little, usually like a little bit more delicate um, than the Dutchman's breeches do. Um, the flowers look very similar, but they also look a little bit different. So these lobes on the flowers right here, we see my laser pointer, all those spurs. And you can see in the Dutchman's breeches, the spurs are a lot more pronounced, or the squirrel corn is a little bit more lobed and heart-shaped. Um, so that's that's the best way to tell them apart. But sometimes I, when I see these plants out in the woods, I kind of second guess myself a little bit. They're super easily confused. But like I said, a little bit more delicate, more compact than Dutchman's breeches. And then the leaves seem to be a little bit more greenish gray than dark green like the Dutchman's breeches are. Um, also pollinated by bumblebees. If you look at our range map here, it's a little less, a little bit more scattered than our Dutchman's breeches. So the squirrel corn, it's a little bit, a little bit more scattered, but still that kind of Northeast quarter of the United States. You don't really see it too far off from in western Iowa. There's a few counties it looks like it, it persists there. Probably some of those major river woodlands, but kind of that eastern third of the state is where you're going to see most of it. It's where we have most of our timber. So bellwort, so we're going to move, starting to move on a little bit. I have not seen bellwort bloom yet. Usually I kind of see this one blooming a lot when I'm out like morel mushroom hunting. 
So billwort, kind of an April through June bloom, likes rich, shady woodlands. And this one is easily distinct, easy to identify, because it kind of has uh, grass-like leaves, but it all looks kind of twisted and droopy. The, the flowers look kind of sad, like they're hanging in the wind. The flowers usually have a really distinct droop and twist to them, like you can see here on this bloom. Another bee pollinated one. It looks like it's wilted. It's not, I mean, it's just the way it naturally is. It's not like it has a, a deficiency or something like that. Just a pretty droopy kind of lonesome looking flower. Another one that's pretty common to the Eastern, kind of that Northeast, even in the South too, but kind of the Eastern half, Eastern third of the US. That's bellwort. Wild ginger is another really cool one. I've seen wild ginger leaves out already. I haven't seen any blooming wild ginger yet um, that I, I don't think I've seen it so far. I don't think I've seen wild ginger yet. So this one, you should see it in April. You're, you're gonna see it mushroom hunting if you go mushroom hunting this spring. It likes really shady, moist woodlands. It has a really distinct heart-shaped leaf and that leaf is, is pretty hairy, especially on the underside. Um, and it has this really distinct, maroon flower it has like these three big maroon petals they kind of kind of curl up into a tapered point this one pollinated by like gnats and flies right this one um i think also might have a little bit of that meat smell to it a lot of times these purple flowers that are pollinated by like gnats and flies and beetles are kind of tricking the insects into thinking there's some sort of meat laying there to eat also pretty common in the eastern half of the United States. Marsh marigold. This is one, this is a, a kind of a northern species. If you look at the range map, it's that northern Midwest up through the north, you know, up in northeast. Um, it's a, see it blooming in April. And I like with the name, we call it marsh marigold. Um, it likes low wet soils banks of stream stream edges marshes um has kind of like kidney to heart shaped leaves like the leaves kind of vary in their shape depending on the plant or depending on its growth stage but kind of has this kidney heart shaped leaf really bright yellow flower um pollinated by flies bees ants i haven't seen it blooming here yet it's probably a little bit later into april um you kind of find it in the northeast quarter of Iowa. You're not going to find it probably as far um, southwest Iowa. It's more of a woodland wetland species. Well, I lived in Minnesota. Um, I really kind of lived in just south of Duluth, and we saw I saw it a lot up there. Uh, and if you go into some of the like state parks, especially going to Wisconsin state parks, you usually find it a lot. Um, you know, here in a few weeks. Kind of a some of these plants have a lot of different common names. I forgot to mention. So I have my common name, the one that I call it by, or it's most commonly um, listed at as an ID book. Um, but I also have in parentheses the Latin name for it. One of the common names for marsh marigold is cowslip because it has a it has a a toxic element to cows, and then if cows grazed on it, it starts stumbling around and get pretty sick. So that's um, one of the common names too is cowslip. Some of these plants have a lot of different uh, common names, regional names, depending when and where you are. This is a plant that I loved. It is, I just love to see. I see it and it always really makes me happy. Um, this one's called dog tooth violet. Another name for it is trout lily. Um, it start, will start blooming here in April. It has these two leaves, as two leaves coming out of the base of the ground, they're green and somewhat slender, kind of like a small tulip leaf, almost sort of. Um, but it has like it's green, but it kind of has like these uh, liver, not liver spots, but these like kind of darker blotches on them. Um, when the plant, I believe, I could be misspeaking, but when the seed germinates, the first year, um, one leaf will rep be represented. The second year, second leaf will come out. And then I think it takes potentially up to three years for it to get a bloom. Um, that's what I've read. Uh, it has this nodding white flower, pollinated by bumblebees. 
And this one is like a, a moist, rich woodlands, bottomlands kind of thing. Um, but another, another, um, I see this a lot out at Makokota Cave State Park outside of Makokota here. Um, here in a few weeks, you go hiking kind of down through the bottoms, you'll probably find a fair amount of, of dog tooth violet. We're kind of getting towards the end. I, obviously, this list isn't all comprehensive. There are plenty more plants and there are plenty more rare plants that you're not going to see every day. These are the ones that we're all apt to see kind of hiking around the woods and some of the prairies and stuff. But this one is a fun one. It's called Jack in the Pulpit. It's a kind of famous one. It likes rich, moist woodlands. It has like one or two pretty big leaves. It's like a three-pointed oval leaflet. Um, so with the flower, this picture is kind of bright, but kind of like the skunk cabbage, it has this, this spathe, this covering that covers the spatic. So this kind of club in the middle where the flowers are actually located is this green kind of transitioning to maroon. It's kind of stripy. Um, it's pollinated by gnats. And I hope no one's ever tried this, but if you eat like the root of it, it's, it's a, uh, very, very, very unpleasant, even painful. My grandpa would always try to trick us into eating it, which is really mean because it's like, it's like, I want to say it's spicy, but it's kind of like spice mixed with fiberglass on your tongue. It's not good. Um, but you find it the Eastern half of the United States. I used to see this one a lot, mushroom hunting. Um, looking at my calendar, April 25th was the first day I saw it last year. So probably later this month, we'll be seeing Jack in the Pulpit start popping up. They call that the little uh, spadix, that little flower club in the middle. They call that um, Jack, or sometimes they call it the preacher. And then this part, they call it the pulpit. So a little, little, little dude in there preaching, I guess. Looks like we have a question. Oh, Sarah says nasty grandpa. Yeah, my grandpa was full of all sorts of folksy tricks like that, even if they were kind of mean-spirited occasionally. I believe this might be my last one, and this is a prairie species, and it's one of my favorite ones that I see blooming early on the prairies, um, kind of late April, early May. This is called hoary pacoon. Um, it's a spring, early summer flower, so you're kind of, kind of marking the end of the spring ephemerals. By this time, most things are pretty bloomed out or pretty leafed out, I should say, in the woods. But in the prairies, most of the tall plants and tall grasses haven't gotten big yet. So kind of the early, so like midsummer, I mean, sorry, late spring, early summer on the prairies, a lot of times you have lower growing plants because some of those taller grasses haven't grown up to shade out those plants yet. So kind of like prairie ephemerals, even though, um, Hoary Pacoon kind of lasts a long time, so it might not be technically an ephemeral, but I thought I'd throw it in here. I'm very much looking forward to seeing it. This likes dry to medium, mesic uh, soil prairies, savannas as well. So savannas would be kind of like that oak trees mixed in with prairie, kind of where the prairie and the forest kind of mush together. Um, it can be about 15 inches tall. The leaves are dark green and they're hairy. That's what hoary means, is kind of another word for having hairs on a plant. Small little leaves, pretty distinct orange yellow flowers. They grow in a cluster. Um, sometimes they kind of look like they have flat tops on them in a, in a cluster there. Um, I'm, you know, pollinated kind of, you know, by our, 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 our bees and butterflies once again by this time most of the, in, the insects are pretty much emerged hoary pacoon you see a lot in the northern and kind of um, middle tall grass prairie ecosystem and even into um, some parts of the great plains and stuff and further out east as well but we have our it's a, it's a pretty tall grass it's a tall grass prairie species i would call it and we'll be seeing that bloom here maybe maybe in may sometime in May. Cool. Thank you all very much for joining me. Thank you for all the questions. Um, I'm, I know I did a lot of talking at you, a lot of rambling. And I wasn't able to interact with you face to face. 
Um, but I just wanted to share with you some of the more common spring ephemerals and wildflowers that you can find around here. It wasn't an all encompassing list, but it's a good one for ones that we know that we can go outside and um, see this time of year or coming up. Um, looks like we have a question here, which is kind of best books for spring flower identification. So the books that I like to use, um, the one that I got started out on when I first started um, getting into native plants when I was in college is this one. I don't know if it's backwards for you on your screen, but on my screen it is. It's um, Wildflowers of Iowa Woodlands. It's the second, and this is the second edition. Um, Sylvan Runkle, famous conservationist in Iowa. He's, I believe he's since passed away. This is a good book to really get you started for the common stuff. Uh, it's kind of arranged in sort of bloom date. The early bloomers are in the front of the book and the late bloomers are in the back of the book. It's obviously not always gonna be in the correct order in which you see them just because there's different conditions. And a lot of times, a lot of these plants kind of all start blooming all at once, like what I'm seeing right now with a handful of the ones that I've seen just start blooming this last week or two. Um, this is not an all encompassing book. There's, you start, you find a lot of plants and flowers that a little bit more rare that aren't represented in here. But this is a great one. If you just want to go hit some parks, some rec areas, some wildlife areas, state parks, hike the trails this time of year or throughout the growing season, but this time of year especially, um, the Wildflowers of Iowa Woodlands is a great one. Um, another one that I use a lot for prairie stuff is there is a prairie, I don't have it in front of me, but there's a prairie edition of like the Iowa wildflowers of Iowa's prairies. That's the, the same Sylvan Runkle, like um, same book. And there's another one for wetlands as well, kind of in the series. A lot of times you can find them at local bookstores. I believe the University of Iowa Press sell these. Um, our gift shop at the Hirschfeld Trooper Center sells them sometimes. Um, for prairies, a lot of times I use that prairie one I talked about. Also this one, Tallgrass Prairie Wildflowers. This one isn't Iowa specific, but um, it's kind of the entire tall grass prairie region. There's a lot of rare plants that you're not gonna see represented in this book, but it gives you a little bit more of a wide range of plants to look at than maybe the, the, the Iowa Wildflowers of the Prairie book that I showed you or mentioned. Um, another one that I use, that this one is a little bit, isn't quite as user friendly for the beginner. As Iowa prairie plants, it's a lot more comprehensive list. Once again, not every single plant is in there because there's some really rare plants out there apparently. Um, but this one is cool. I first got introduced to this book when I started taking like native botany classes in college. Um, this is the one that I use. I have a bunch of printouts in here. This one, um, it's, in, it's arranged by plant family. So and it's also not colored, but it does have some pretty detailed sketches in it. Um, this one, if you really want to get into the weeds, so to speak, with prairie plants, great one. Um, this one isn't Iowa specific, but this one I like a lot. It's the Peterson Field Guide to Wildflowers for the Northeastern and North Central United States. You have prairie stuff in it, but you have a lot of the woodland species in it as well. It isn't quite as beginner friendly as this one is, but has a lot of great stuff in it. And, um, it has some color photos, some not, but it has quite a bit of wildflowers in there. There's obviously there's probably some more books out there, but these those are the ones, these are the ones that I use quite often. All right. Ah. So we have a few questions here. Anne asks, when does Jack have the red berries? The red berry is its fruit. Um, seed. So it's going to have those red berries kind of in, you can start seeing them, um, you know, late summer, early fall. Um, it's going to be a little bit, but they'll have these, this bright red berry cluster where the flower was later on late fall. I mean, sorry, late, late summer, early fall. Cool. Ooh, the first book that I mentioned, Anne, is the um, Wildflowers of Iowa Woodlands. 
this one's awesome um, for the common stuff that you're going to see. Like I said, it's kind of in a uh, order of bloom date, sort of. So uh, Carol's asking, will I have my slides or this posted somewhere online? I am going to take this recording and upload it to my um, the Jackson County Conservation YouTube channel. So probably tomorrow I'll have it on there sometime. If all things go according to plan, I will email everyone who's in attendance on here the link to that, or you can search it as well. Um, I won't have my slides up just online or anything, but I'll, this, this program will be forever on YouTube as long as YouTube is a thing, I would assume. And I want to thank everyone so much for coming and joining me. I see a few repeat names. This winner has been a, a fun winner for these evening virtual programs. I probably won't do any evening virtual programs for a while. It's getting warm outside. We're doing a lot more in-person programming here at the Hurstville Center. I'm doing a lot more with our schools, so I don't quite have as much time to do as many evening programs. I might sometime in the summer, but probably probably not for a while. So this is, thank you all much for joining me on my, one of my last ones for a while. Uh, if there's any questions, I can hang out for a little bit here. Um, otherwise, I wanna thank you all so much and I want you to have a great spring. Go out, look for some wildflowers. Send me an email if you want to get some, some ideas of places to go hiking. Um, Really quick before I go, if you're not signed up for our newsletter or anything like that, go on to our Facebook page or our website. We have a lot of really cool events coming up. We have a pretty full spring calendar of events. Um, some things that are going on tomorrow, the tomorrow, April 2nd, we were supposed to have a public night burn um, at one of our prairies. We had to cancel it. So if you were planning on coming, unfortunately it's canceled. The wind is supposed to be close to 25 miles an hour tomorrow. That's a little too intense for what we need um, being so close to town. The wind's supposed to be in the wrong direction too. So we're gonna try to postpone that to hopefully next Friday if all conditions are correct. Um, another cool one coming up April 6th. Uh, April 6th at 6 p.m. We're doing a prairie hike out at Hamil the Hamilton Prairie, which is a private prairie owned by Ray Hamilton. He's a friend of mine. He's owned this prairie for close to 40 years, I think. And parts of the prairie, our remnant prairie, never plowed prairie. It's super cool. We might catch some early blooms. We'll see. We'll do a lot of um, dormant or uh, dead plant ID, kind of like last year's dead, and also seeing some of those early emerging herbaceous parts of the prairie plants. We're gonna do a number of prairie walks out there during the warm season. But April 6th is our first one. Email me or call the Hirschville Center to sign up for that. Really, really cool. Um, we have a my, my coworker, Jen, April 7th, is doing a virtual program. It's uh, Frogs and Toads of Iowa. If you learn about more of the frogs and toads, learn about their calls, um, sign up for that. Um, and the last one I'm going to mention before, I don't want to read all 30 of these to you, but the next one, next Friday, April 9th at Whitewater Canyon, we're doing a, a woodcock walk in Owl Prowl, which is, um, the woodcock is a native bird that lives here. And it's, we're just starting to get into mating season. The woodcock likes um, the habitat with young trees kind of touching like prairie. We have some young emergent early successional trees. So on clear nights this time of year, what happens is the male woodcocks, they will kind of strut out to an area. A lot of times it's on the mowed path if you're lucky enough to see them. And they do this, they fly into the air pretty high up, they kind of twirl in the air, then they kind of free fall in a spiral down to the ground, land on the ground, get up through this little strut thing, and I keep repeating it. And um, they'll do that right at sunset, or right at twilight, so like this time, I don't know if you all can see it, the same I can, but pretty dark, but there's a little bit of hue, stuff in the sky, or early morning. So that is April 9th, Whitewater Canyon, one of the coolest county properties around, that's managed by Dubuque County Conservation, but naturalists from Dubuque, Jackson, and Jones County Conservation will be there. Um, so sign up in advance for that. It might be chilly if you come out. 
please dress for the weather. And let's look if I have any more questions. Anne has a question. It says, the blood root before it opens looks purple. Have I noticed? I've yeah, when it first emerges from the ground, like from its root, that 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 bud does look pretty purple. I have seen it purple kind of um at the tip. And also ask what the Jackson County website again is again. It's Jackson ccb.com we just put a boatload of spring public events on there we'll be putting um summer stuff up kind of as we get a little bit closer to june uh may and june we'll start putting some more more things on but very happy to start doing some of these programs more in person again now that we can kind of be outside and space out accordingly all right everyone thank you all so much I don't see any other questions, so I am going to end this meeting. I want you all have to have a great, fun weekend out hiking, looking for wildflowers. It's supposed to be super warm, I think close to 70 on Sunday. So get out there, hit your local uh, conservation area, find some spring wildflowers. The, the perfect time to start right now.